Today on Across the Fence, healing through growing. We visit with members of a veterans group who have traded their fatigues for overalls in hopes of growing a business and finding a way to mend the wounds of war. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Keith Silva, in for Judy Simpson. We talk a lot in this program about the challenges facing farmers, from weather to market to the physical labor it takes to work the land. Farming is, as the saying goes, a tough road to hoe. For farmers who have served in the military, the hard work of farming can also be a path out of the darkness of depression and a way to heal the unseen scars of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. The Farmer Veteran Coalition mobilizes veterans by helping servicemen and women find sustainable careers and places them to heal on our nation's farms. From battlefields to farm fields, the Farmer Veteran Coalition works with veterans to serve their country in a different way. The chair of the Farmers Veteran Coalition of Vermont is John Turner. He served two tours in Iraq with the U.S. Marines. And next to John is Frank Hill, who is the coalition vice president. He served with the U.S. Army in Iraq. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Did you guys know each other in the military or did you meet afterwards? Uh, we met afterwards through the uh, coalition. So you met with the, through the coalition and that's how, you, that, that's how you get to know each other because you had an interest in farming or? Um, yeah, John had already uh, begun the processes of, uh, of establishing the state chapter, and I contacted the national chapter and said, you know, I need help with a business, uh, you know, revising my business plan. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, you should go down to uh, Montpelier and talk with several people here. And then I met John and uh, been grateful for it ever since. That's great. John, did you have a background in farming? Were you, were, was your plan once you got uh, discharged from the military to, to begin a farm? Not at all. Um, agriculture is in my ancestral line, but it skipped a couple generations. Um, my family comes from Indiana and Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, when I got out, you know, I started making art and writing poetry as a method to understand like my wartime experience and it wasn't until I met my wife in 2009 that we had our first garden plot and from there everything kind of changed and our plots doubled in size until now we manage a ten and a half acre farmstead um, where we have implemented a lot of regenerative practices and then a small two and a half acre forest farm where we do a lot of educational work with students and veterans and community members. And it was from your work in agriculture that you organized this retreat that was partially for the coalition but partially for veterans uh, you know that you had met like Frank tell me about that what was that about? I think that when we're in service, we have this camaraderie among us, um, whether we've deployed or not, whether we've seen combat or not. And that's something that when, when a service member gets out of the military, it's difficult to find that again. Um, there's difficulties in transitioning out of military and into community, uh, uh, civilian life. Mm -hmm. And any time we have the opportunity to get together with our veteran friends, you know, we can, we can smoke and joke, as they call it, and just kind of tell stories and, you know, see where each other's at and check in on each other because, like, that's what we used to do when we were in combat. That's what we used to do in the service. And it, it's different for, for people who have come home after going through such traumatic events at a young age to not have a community understand their life experience up until that point. And too often times people become a statistic or they fall down a really dark path, and that's not okay. You know, we, we, we owe it to each other to take care of each other when we get home. What about for you, Frank? What was that retreat like for you? Uh, that retreat was something absolutely beautiful. Um, I mean, I've never, since being out of the military, actually even being in the military, I've never seen quite, uh, quite as strong of a connection of people. I mean, um, and, and normally, you know, like John said, you know, uh, the veterans have like their own um, draw towards one of uh, one another, and uh, and like we had civilians present, um, like uh, not, not not trying to talk down any, um, but you know there's there's a, like a certain bond veterans have, and and we generally don't open up as much um, with others that don't have that same understanding, and to to have everybody just be so open and close. It was, uh, it was truly a breathtaking uh, event. We hear a lot in the military when it comes to veterans about PTSD. I referenced it in the beginning. <coughs> Can each of you share a personal experience to help people understand what that means to you uh, as far as the stress that servicemen and women are going through 
would that would, would, would PTSD or their, their, I guess you said their civilian lives, like you said afterwards, John, once they get out. Yeah. So I had a buddy, it was in, um, it was in July of 2006, we were in Ramadi, um, and we took incoming mortar rounds daily. That was just sometimes multiple times a day, and they were 120s. Um, so they're really, really big Shit. rockets, um, projectiles, excuse me. And there was one time we were on post, and I heard the outgoing, which is a, a really deep um, thump, and it echoed through the city, and it's just like, you know, you know it's coming, um, but you kind of like, just hold on to your britches because you don't know where it's going to land. And um, I remember the first round impacted on top of the government center and then the second round. And after the third round hit, I could hear my buddy screaming and his post was entirely engulfed in smoke. And I could still hear him screaming through rockets, through gunfire and um, from about 200 meters away. And what had happened was uh, he was the roving post, so he was going around checking on the post on top of the building. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the guy who, was, who he was relieving to go take a pee break for um, got out, and uh, he moved his chair literally an inch or an, uh, a foot forward. And that's actually what saved his life because the mortar round hit the back of the chair, mm -hmm. hit his armor plate, and blew a hole in his back about that big. But he's, he was still alive. And I remember hearing him scream, and it was at that point um, where I realized something, something needed to change. And I was getting ready to re-enlist, and I had already been on two deployments prior to that one, and I was just, I was done. Um, and then a month later, I got hit by a piece of shrapnel that was a quarter inch from severing my carotid artery. And it's, it's, it's those moments where, why did, why did you live? Like, why did you survive? And I had a lot of those. Um, and a lot of people have had experiences far more traumatic than that. Um, but it, it's enough to kind of to tweak your perspective in a way that allow you to want to make different, uh, different, different movements in your life. And then also having to deal with that near miss, if you will. And 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 we're not here to trade war yeah, stories yeah, yeah. by by any means like that. Frank, when you before you enlisted and you know you had heard about this, was was PTSD or something like that? Where a lot of times in we talk in agriculture, like oh it won't happen to me, an accident or something like that. Is that the same sort of thing when it comes to oh that won't happen to me? Yeah, I, I kind of had that mentality going in, but um, you know I I think there's a huge misconception on what PTSD is, and literally every person has PTSD. Right. It, each one of us is born with a negative bias, and that, that's just a survival instinct. That's a primal instinct that we still have with us. You know, um, if, if you, or if I were to say something offensive to you, mm -hmm. you will react in a manner having PTSD. You'll draw back and you'll try to defend yourself as if I was trying to physically harm you. Right. And that's what PTSD is, and, and people don't understand, like, you know, it just comes in, in, in different levels for different people. It doesn't make anybody a threat. It doesn't, um, you know, it's, it's something that everybody needs to work through and that everybody shares. Right. And it could be anything, for, you know, for you guys, it happened a lot, rockets coming in and out or shells, but whether it was a car accident or anything a, like that. A car accident, yeah. um, you know, uh, some, something as simple as, uh, as a relationship that's gone sour. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it can taint you for the next one right. or... or uh, a PTO accident. Or right, anything exactly. Like anything like exactly. That. Farming is isolating work, especially in a rural place like Vermont. How does your organization account for this, given that your, your members may be recovering from those traumas and may be isolated? We've had um, the pleasure of working some, with some really amazing organizations, you know, since before we actually established the chapter. Um, we have a laundry list of, like, the agency, NOFA, UVM Extension, Center for Sustainable Ag, Cabot, um, Rural Vermont, uh, for my agribility, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and because of their feet in the door, we've been able to reach out to veterans that we probably wouldn't have been able to. And what we've found is that the knowledge base within our board, within our supporters, is through the roof. And wherever we can't step in, um, because we might not know how, how to work with a certain educational system, then maybe someone from Sterling College can say, hey, we'll try it this way. Gotcha. And uh, we're able to reach out to these vets. Mm. 
And it's really an amazing thing to watch people like, you know, send emails or call um, and, and, and say, hey, like, I've been farming. I would love to be able to support this. Right. Or I would love to get into farming. And so they just kind of come out of the woodwork. And I think that's just the nature of, of who we are as service members, but mm. the nature of farming. Right. You know, it's, it's a way to, to understand ourselves through working with the land. It's a way to understand our communities and to provide for our, for our communities through working with the land. So we we're talking about the Farmer Veteran Coalition and sort of what they do and the importance of, of their work and how you guys have been working with them. So, so in a nutshell, John, what is that Farmer Veteran Coalition? It's a tight-knit group of people who want to help each other succeed in life. Okay. And our, one of our goals is to help any veteran transition into agriculture by whatever means that is, um, or to help someone who's already in agriculture, you know, expand their operation or market it a little bit differently. Um, this past, and two weeks ago, we, we launched a, a state initiative uh, from a national project, the Homegrown by Heroes. Right. Um, through the Agency of Agriculture at the State House, and was able to, to let it be known that there is this program available that helps veterans market their product as being a veteran from a veteran owned operation. And for some people, that means something. For some people, it doesn't. But I think a lot of people, a lot of non veterans, they want to know how they can support a veteran. Right. And to support an agriculture operation, I think, is one of the most noble things you can do. And let's help you out with, the, with your brand there. You've got a hat here yeah. that, we, uh, that we should show that is the Farmers Coalition hat. And uh, Ryan Wilson, our director, can get a, a close-up on that. Well, well, I ask you, uh, I am curious, are there unique um, uh, opportunities or, or difficulties, I guess difficulties for veterans transitioning from the military to agriculture? Would it be any different if you were transitioning from the military to accounting or... Is there a special, a special, you know, thing when it comes to agriculture uh, that that makes it more challenging? So, w when I first met John, uh, and down at his farm, um, you know, I, one of the questions I asked him was like, "So, wh why'd you get into farming?" And he looked at me and he paused and he goes, "Just made sense." <laughs> and, and, and that was like the most brilliant answer I've ever heard from from anybody like and because because you, you get down to the brass tacks of things and I mean you're you're used to the physical labor you're used to being outside mm -hmm. um, you find something rewarding in that and I, I don't know about you but you know as being infantry back in uh, garrison you know we went from being called our, our uh, nomenclature of 11 Bravo to 11 detail like we were out there you know mowing the lawn all the time okay. and, and tripping the shrubs and, and we were doing you know all this outdoor work and shoot it should have been vegetables we were taking care of and not grasses <laughs> you mentioned the homegrown uh by heroes uh tag as well and that's a that's something that is a label that people can find uh on products seeds what what exactly john it's it's really specific to the farmer's operation um Vermont, I believe, is the 17th state to adopt this, this initiative, um, which was started by uh, Kentucky, I think, back in 2011 or 2013. I can't remember the number or the date. Um, and what that essentially means is you, you apply for, uh, for this label uh, through the Farmer Veteran Coalition National Project, and you submit like a business plan. And they, they, they're really you know, tedious, or, uh, not tedious, uh, uh, attentive to, mm -hmm. to everything um, that you're doing because they want to make sure that if they're putting their name on something, that it's up to the highest par. Right. And um, what that essentially allows is a veteran to, to market their materials as being veteran-owned, whether it's produce, whether it's livestock, whether it's meat, whether it's eggs um, or, or a value-added product. Um, what the little label on it shows is that this is coming from a veteran-owned operation. Right. That's great. We've got about a minute left. I want to give some contact information. Uh, is this something where if somebody is out there that was a veteran, uh, there have been five thousand, there are five thousand one hundred and twelve in Vermont that have served post nine eleven. They, they just need to get in contact with you guys. Yeah, please, absolutely, uh, yeah. without a doubt. And we're working on our state's website through the Farmer Veteran Coalition. It Great. will be up within the next couple months. But as of right now, we've been using the Farm Bureau as a catalyst. They've been extremely supportive, um, and they can get in contact through uh, with us through them and I have that contact information to contact the Vermont chapter of the farmer veteran Coal uh Coalition, you can email John at wildrootsfarmvt at gmail.com or call 802-434-5640.
46. Uh, there's also a Facebook page that you can check out on the Farmer Coalition of Vermont. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Great talking with you. Thank I'd you also sir. like to thank everyone here at WCAX for making this program possible. And as always, thank you for stopping by Across the Fence.